G'day there, Nick Bowditch here. Today, in my COVID cancelled keynote, uh, I was going to be presenting uh, this particular keynote uh, to a corporate audience at a very buttoned down, you know, white collar tie and jacket type event and type audience. Um, but instead, today, I'm going to be presenting it to you from my lounge room. Um, because COVID has unfortunately stepped in and cancelled this keynote uh, because there's very few events happening in person and most of them happening online or, or not at all now. So because of that, um, I wanted to bring this keynote still to the world. I, I, I still feel like there's value in presenting this information and there's value in getting this information. I don't want to just let it dwindle away or let, uh, let that part of my career um, dwindle away either. And I want to stay, keep my hand in and I still want to be able to affect some change and help some people if that is a nice byproduct of that as well, then great. Um, so to that end today, uh, I would have been presenting this presentation, which is actually the presentation I did at my TEDx talk, um, which is called My Mental Illness is a Gift. So sometimes when I present the, um, do the presentations that are very much based around mental health and mental illness and entrepreneurial mental illness in, in particular, um, I love doing it with a crowd uh, like I would have been doing it today, which is a very corporate crowd not necessarily expecting this sort of content um, but today um, I'm going to present it to you and I hope that you guys enjoy it too and get something out of it as well so without further ado let me kick straight on in and start the presentation today I'm going to be talking about how you know my mental illness and the things that I live with the way that my brain works differently to, uh, to other people uh, actually has something of a positive in my life now I can see that. I couldn't see that for a long, long time. But now I know that the things that are different about me and the things that are different in my head and different in the way that I think actually is of an advantage to me, is a good thing for me. And uh, today I want to talk about that. In, in by talking about it, by me talking about my uh, flaws in this way, maybe it can help you kind of re-look at some of the things that you um, live with as well and maybe see the positives out of those things as well. So my story is this, I come from a um, startup background, from a learning and development background, but I've also spent a long time in corporate land, um, particularly working for big brands like Facebook and Twitter, where I helped small businesses market themselves better by um, telling them, teaching them how to tell stories better, how to be better storytellers, um, how to be more honest and authentic and original storytelling uh, and how that sort of storytelling can help build businesses as well as build your own profiles. But in that way, I was also able to learn at the real coalface of it, you know, what entrepreneurial people, what startup people, what small business people go through and what they live with in their own head um, and why that's important, why telling the story of the stuff that you might not be that great at or dealing that well with is actually to your advantage as well in building a business or building a profile or just building an honest version of yourself, which is largely what I want to talk about today. Um, I am fortunate to have built and sold startup businesses of my own. I'm fortunate to have worked in big corporate social media companies uh, like Facebook and Twitter and being able to now to around Australia usually <laughs> and around the world usually, um, being able to tell the story of how I built those businesses, being able to talk, tell the story about how you know storytelling and good marketing has helped small businesses and startups all across the world and how I might help them as well. That's kind of one side of what I do. The other side of me though is that I am someone who lives with mental illness, um, Ill illnesses in my head. I'm somebody who has that as part of their day and their life to deal with and to rebound from and to try and find resilience in and, and all those sorts of things. You know, some days my mental illness is so marked and so kind of present in my head that I can't, I can't do anything about it. I can't, I can't function as well as I might otherwise. I can't do the things I might otherwise do. And so in telling the story about those sort of two sides of me, you know, I've had the feedback before. Well, how how do both of those sides exist 
in the one person, in the one head, you know, and, and to be honest, it's sometimes it is a bit of a struggle. It is a bit of a challenge at times to be able to reconcile all that within the one head. Um, but other times, and particularly now that I've reassessed and kind of reframed my story, it, it helps me do that much, much easier, right? Because I, uh, there, well, there's an Aristotle quote, um, uh, no great mind ever existed without a touch of madness. And I think that's absolutely true. You think of all the people who've changed the world in the last century, you know, all of those people think differently. All of those people were innovative thinkers who, who did things differently, who thought differently, who behaved differently, who taught differently, who marketed themselves differently. You know, all of that stuff is a real bonus to people if they can think differently think a little bit out of the box and sometimes if you have a if you live with a mental illness as i do you do think differently you do think out of the box it's not like something you choose to do <laughs> always and sometimes it's not very helpful um, but the majority of the time it, it it really is and if you like me are in that entrepreneurial type small business startup world um there's lots and lots of studies lots and lots of data on this but if, but but essentially the one that, that always sticks with me is if you are entrepreneurial, then you are two and a half times more likely to also live with depression, anxiety, mood disorder, bipolar, um, PTSD, um, or have an addiction to a substance or a process, two and a half times more likely. So, you know, if you're sitting in that space and thinking you're different, thinking you're alone, thinking that nobody else understands that, then, you know, yeah, that's not exactly true, right? Because we're all kind of in that same space. When you go through a rehabilitation facility, for instance, as I've been through, um, or when you go to see, uh, you know, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, when you're first starting to navigate your way through what's going on for you differently, people in that space and in the recovery world often talk about the term defects of character, the things that are different about you, the things that are that make you different from other people are often sort of classed and framed and talked about as if your character is defective. There is something wrong with you. And, you know, if I think about those things, if I think about my mental illnesses, if I think about my mistakes, my flaws, my my predispositions to different things that aren't altogether healthy for me, if I think about those things of defects of my character, they absolutely will be, right? So I've had to try and reframe that stuff as much as I can. I've had to try and think differently about even just that term, you know, defects of character, and think of, instead, think of these things that are different about me as gifts that were given to me. You know, not defects, but gifts. And sometimes it's difficult to see that. Sometimes it's difficult for other people, certainly, to see that in you. But I'm, I'm a very big believer in the fact that the things that make me different have been given to me for a reason. Um, you know, I, I'm given these things to be in control of more. I, I think given these things to uh, enhance my life more. And sometimes, you know, they don't. And sometimes it's a bit of a, a bit of a hard journey. But Largely, once you start to think about those things, once I start to think of those things as my gifts, they, they really are, you know? So, so yeah, I, I think about and I think those things that rather than being defects of my character, I try to think of them as gifts. I try to think of them as my superpowers, you know, as the things that absolutely make me me. I am superhuman. If I'm able to live with what I live with, and we'll talk about this in a second, but if I'm able to live with all those things going on and still be functional, still be able to function as a, as a man, as a father, as a business owner, you know, as a professional person um, and not just crumble in a heap, then, then something is making me super human. And what I think those things are is the things that other people might see as defects in my character or in theirs. So I want you to stop and think for a second about what your superpowers might be um, we all have them, we don't all recognize them, but sometimes we, we think of these things as, you know, downsides, as negatives, and sometimes they are these gifts that are, you know, gifts wrapped in shit, 
<laughs> is a term that I use a lot and it's and it's so true you know once you peel away all the crap from outside there's that beautiful gift but it's, sometimes it's just hard and it's just too daunting to even start digging through the shit to find that gift but I'd like you to think about that for a second and even if it means you have to stop uh, just pause the, the video and normally I do this in a audience environment where I stop for two minutes of you know thinking music and people write this stuff down but think about those things that that other people or that you might think about yourself as being a negative thing, right? For instance, people say about me that I am too loud and too opinionated, right? Both of those things are, are probably true, but both of those things I choose to reframe into superpowers. So the defective side, the negative side is that, um, uh, you know, I, I think of these things as being, you know, that I'm too loud and, and too opinionated, right? Is on one side. The superpower version of that, though, is that I'm. people know where I stand. People know what I think about things. People aren't surprised at my reaction to things very much. They know which side of a particular discussion I'm going to be on because they've heard it from me. And the other thing is that I am heard. You know, it might be that I'm loud to some people, but I choose to think that I am, or to choose to, front, to focus on the fact that I get heard. And, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's very easy for people to slip through the net, be isolated, be disconnected and be unheard. And it's really sad that in 2020, we're still talking about that disconnection through being unheard. So those are my superpowers. I'd love to know what yours are, right? So take a moment, even if you have to stop the video and just think about those things and, and reframe that. Maybe if you write it down as, you know, I'm too loud, but then in the other column on the bit of paper you're using, just write, you know, but I'm heard, you know, I might be... Um, I might be late all the time, but you know, when I'm there, I, I'm 100% present, that, that kind of thing. Um, just take a couple of minutes now to, to work on that and to, um, to write, scribble a few of those things down and it might help you change those things, reframe the story from being you know, a, a negative, a defect of your character into a superpower. Okay, so normally in a group environment, I would go through those things. We'd have a few people sing out theirs, and and you know sometimes people say, "Well, this is my this is the defect," but I've got no idea what the superpower is, you know. And and I'm able to help them sometimes say, "Oh, it's because you're this," and or maybe maybe you're this. But we won't do that now. Obviously, it's it's a bit difficult in this environment. But I'd really support you to think about those things that you've written down, less as a negative thing, less as a defective thing and more as a superpower. We'll talk about superpowers more as we go through this as well. But these are some of my defects, some of the things that have been told to me as being defects, something that's wrong with me. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I work with in the one-on-one, -on -one, in the therapy, sort of counselling support stuff that I do with people, um, people come to me and they say, more or less what they're saying is, I need you to fix me. This is what's wrong with me, so I need you to fix me, you know, or I need to be fixed, or somebody else wants me to be fixed, or whatever. And and I'm constantly getting people to kind of reframe that because you can't be fixed unless there is something wrong with you. And just because you think differently, just because you have a different set of priorities, or you have, you know, uh, you process things differently or whatever. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It just makes you you. So to, and sometimes we just have to work out how to fit you back into the ecosystem that from which you've come to me or come to anyone for help. And, and sometimes, you know, it's just really focusing on that with people. That there's nothing wrong with you. You're just different. You just think differently. You're just not like everybody else. And let's celebrate that as opposed to encouraging you to conform back into whatever it is somebody else wants you to be. That's a terrible and dangerous thing for a lot of us to try and do. Because when you can't do that, it ends up being something that makes you sad, something that makes you anxious and so on. Speaking of which, these are my defects of character, right? So the first one is is and i want to talk about them in in terms of them being a defect or a superpower and maybe we can work out between us which ones we think are which but you know the first one i think about is my mental health you know my, my abject mental health that's very obvious and for people to see and that i talk about quite openly and kind of honestly and authentically you know first thing is that i, I live with depression anxiety and i live with complex ptsd now i say things like i live with because I don't like the term I struggle with or I battle against. You know, words have power, and so I try to, to not give them as much power as I can. I live with depression. My depression sometimes is, is crippling, is unable for me to 
uncover myself from and get up and get join the day you know sometimes i can't do that sometimes i can't get out of bed sometimes i don't feel it at all you know but it, but i feel like it's always there in some way shape or form it's some it's something that's sort of ever present in me and you know i i could have thought and i did think for a long time that it was a massive downside for me it was a real kick in the ass for me that i had to live with that stuff i don't love that um, but, you know, again, it's something that I do live with. I'm medicated against it. I'm happily medicated against it. I will never, you know, I might never in my life not be medicated for it. But right now in my life, I take those tablets and those tablets keep me, the be allow me to be the best version of myself every day. And for as long as that works and for as long as I need it to work, that's going to be my life. There's no shame in that for me. There's no thing that I have to hide from in that. I just, I just don't. That's, that's. I've tried everything. Trust me, I've tried everything and what works for me is the current medications that I take. So that's the first thing that's depression. The anxiety is, is also a, can be a very crippling thing. It's kind of at the opposite end of a spectrum from depression to anxiety, but the anxiety is, is hard to live with too, but it's something that I do live with. Um, it's worse than the depression in a lot of ways for me. I, I would happily give up... Um, you know, if, if I was given the option to just be depressed all the time or be anxious every now and again, I'd, I'd take depressed all the time. The anxiety is very difficult to live with. It's very uh, hard to not focus on. Um, and it's and it makes me, it can make me reclusive. It can make me uh, lash out. It can make me disconnect from people. And, and in all those ways, it's unhealthy for me, right? But it's something that I live with and and that's why we're talking about today, right? The third thing is the complex PTSD. So I um, went through a period of my life as when, I was, when I was a young person, when I was a child, where I was tortured um, physically and sexually and emotionally. And as a result of those things, I, I still live with that stuff every day. I still have that as part of my life every day. I wish it wasn't, you know, but whilst it is, I can choose to see it as a downside again. Or I can choose it as one of my superpowers. You know, I am a survivor of that. I I, I have resilience from that. Some days more than others, <laughs> but you know, I'm still here. You know, they they didn't win. I'm I'm still here, and so I can think of those things as defects, or I can think of those things as my superpowers. Because of all those things, because I live with those things, the superpower version of that, living with those things, is that I really understand people. I have great empathy for people. I, I can listen to people and, and, be, and because I go first, because I share about this stuff quite openly and quite often, it means other people then share that stuff with me and it's the first time they've ever said it too. They've, they feel empowered to take off that coat of shame that's not theirs and, and give it back to the person who perhaps has to live with that. Now, if I didn't have these things, if I didn't live with depression, anxiety, PTSD, perhaps I wouldn't be able to do that as effectively. So that's a, that's a gift for me. That's a superpower. I have obsessive thinking. I obsess about the minutia of the minutia, you know, like, uh, and, and that, while that might be kind of maddening and crazy making for a lot of people, for me, it tends to be very helpful because in my world, in my professional world, apart from my speaking and, and the therapy side of my, my work, I also work with, um, advise and, and invest in startups in Australia and around the world. And a lot of those people come to me because they need not the 60,000 foot view of something. They need the really granular view. Like, why aren't we getting this from this advertising campaign? You know, how do we change this copy? to be a little bit more persuasive or whatever. And I can really drill down on that stuff. So if I didn't have that obsessive thinking, that wouldn't be available to me, you know, it wouldn't be a strength of mine. And so that's a superpower for me. The obsessive thinking, which might otherwise be very kind of crazy making is actually really quite helpful for me and, and, is, and is something of a superpower. I've been an addict before in my life. I, for a long time, the depression and the anxiety, the PTSD, just the general kind of malaise, the general kind of uh, mental illness that I live with, I, I covered that up by using things, by using people, by um, making mistakes every day in terms of what I overindulged in and what I would have problems regulating and, and having moderation around. Now, I'm really fortunate that I've been through 
you know, that kind of initial part of the rehab from that life. I've, I've, I live without the urge to indulge in things that I used to, to use things that I used to. I don't have that um, urge, that part of my brain is, has been quietened. And so I'm very fortunate. I'm one of the very, very, very fortunate ones who've, who've been through that. But because I have been an addict, it means that I, that I know, you know, how to, how to get things out of people without it being a manipulative sort of, you know, disingenuous thing. But I know, again, how people work. I know how my mind works. I know how other people can be persuaded un- un- in- unhealthily into something and I can interject in my- myself in their life if they want me to and be able to help people. I-, I work with a lot of people who live with addiction right now and if I hadn't been through that, I wouldn't be able to share that superpower with, with them or with you or with the rest of the world. So I'm very fortunate for it. It's a weird thing to be fortunate for but or grateful for, but I, but I really am grateful for the time that I spent um, in addiction, in 12-step programs, in sitting in rooms with other people going through the same things. I'm very grateful for that time um, because it's really helped me in my life today. I'm unreliable. <laughs> what could be the upside of that, right? What could be the superpower of that? And the superpower is that nobody relies on you for anything, <laughs> you know? So I think that there is there is something in that. But, you know, also in being unreliable, you, you, it sort of... and. and telling the world that like the world knowing that that's kind of one of my things is the superpower version of that is that I don't get tied down with having to remember this this and this for these people you know I don't I can I can give myself a little bit of a break I don't feel like I need to totally commit to everyone and everything because nobody really asks for that back because they know that there's a chance that I might not necessarily be there at the time when I said I was going to be or whatever so that's actually a superpower for me and un a surprising superpower for me another one is that I'm unpredictable now I don't mean you know that I could just fly off the handle at any moment and flip the table and tell you oh you're this and that and storm out right I mean when I wake up in the morning I don't know my friends and family don't know which version of me they're going to get today right the upside of that the superpower version of that is that when they get the very best side of me then it's really, really good. I'm not risk averse. I take risks. I'm happy to take a risk. You know, I, I'm not sort of freaked out by that. And and so whilst that could be a downside for a lot of people, a lot of people get potentially really anxious around that. For me, um, it means I'm able to do my job better, you know, and particularly, as I mentioned before, I invest in startups. And sometimes I'll be advising a startup that has been given, you know, a million dollars of someone else's money, seed money to go and build the build their business, you know, build this startup business. And for a lot of people, they want to screw, screw all that away and, and not take any risks with it, you know. But I'll be like, oh, don't worry about that. You know, give me that million bucks. I'll go and spend it on this, this and this. You know, I, it, it helps me to be able to take a risk, to be able to take calculated and healthy and sensible risks right which as opposed to my old life I, I took risks that weren't healthy um calculated or sensible um so so again the the superpower in this just in knowing that that's what i live with but this is how to use it in a healthy way i fatigue easily now how is that a superpower right because of my depression and particularly the ptsd um works in a way that makes me tired you know, after exerting my brain or my body for any sort of period of time, sometimes not very long, um, I can't do it anymore. Now, the upside of being someone who fatigues easily is that I get the rest that I need. One of the worst concepts and words that was introduced into startup land, into small business land, into this self-development land that, that I live in is you've got to hustle. You've got to hustle and grind. You've got to put 20 hour days in, you've got to be the one who's the first to, there, first to arrive, last to leave, you've got to do all this stuff. And if you don't do that, you are failing, you are a failure. You, if you can't do that, you can't succeed in this life, you know? And, and I just think it's utter, utter bullshit. I think, you know, I can't, I can't do more than six hours work in a day. I'm flat out doing more than four hours of concentrated work every day. Now, in that four or six hours, you'll get good work out of me. And I can do an eight-hour day. It's just that some of it will just be rubbish because I'll be tired and I'll be listless and I'll be distracted and, and whatever. And the people who are succeeding, certainly in business and in their personal lives these days, are the ones who go, okay, I, I, can, 
we, I can work between 10 and 2, or I can work between 2 and 6 p.m., or I can work between 4 a.m. Like a lot of people I know are up at 4 a.m. doing doing really productive work. Not me. <laughs> no, not me. But some people are, are really good at that, you know. And so I think just being aware of that fatigue is a superpower for me. Just being able to go, okay, I can do this, isn't this? I can't do this, isn't this? I'm not even going to try. Right, I fatigue too easily for that. So let's, if you're going to have a meeting with me, let's make it short and sharp, have an agenda, stick to the topics and, and we'll, and we'll be fine. You know, and that's, that's a real superpower for me because I can encourage other people to do the same. I can encourage other people not to kill themselves working too hard because other, because somebody's told them they're going to be a failure if they don't. This grind and hustle, it's a very dangerous concept for a lot of people. Given that, the majority of people who are hearing that message are two and a half more times, two and a half times more likely to have a mental illness like mine. Something to think about. I'm good at deadlines. This comes from my mental illness too, because I, I can be a very good procrastinator or bad procrastinator, depending on your point of view. You know, like I'll have a deadline, and for about ninety percent of that time, I'll do nothing towards the deadline at all, and then just ramp up right at the end hit it on the mark, perfect every time, not perfect, but hit it on the mark every time. I'm really good at not missing a deadline. And that comes from being able to pace myself, but also able to pick up the pace when I need to and, and have a more concentrated effort towards the end if that's required. Um, that stuff is a superpower of my general kind of depression and anxiety. That's where the anxiety actually helps me for once <laughs> in my life. It's actually really helpful to be a little bit more anxious towards the end and get things done, be a bit more productive. I don't feel pressure and I don't feel nerves like most people do. You know, standing up in front of 2,000 people in an auditorium and delivering a talk about how I was, you know, abused as a child and now have mental illness as a result could be fairly daunting for a lot of people. Um, a lot of normal people probably do get daunted by that. I don't, right? Um, however, in a short, in a small environment, in a boardroom or in a social interaction between one or two people, that makes me very nervous and it makes me very anxious and it makes me very awkward. So the superpower version of that is that I can speak on stage, I can teach on mass, I can deliver my uh, content and my thoughts and my ideas to a lot of people at once in one big room without being nervous and without feeling any kind of pressure about it. That's an absolute superpower for someone who works in you know my career is this my career is speaking in front of people and changing people's minds on things getting people to really think differently if i can't do that because i'm too nervous uh, or because i feel too much pressure from it then obviously it's not helpful for me i'm very well aware of my vulnerabilities i don't need you or anybody else to point those things out the superpower of living with this stuff is that my is my is my awareness around it you know i know exactly where my shortfalls are, I know exactly where my good stuff is too. For a lot of people, they either don't connect to their mental difference, you know, they don't, either don't connect to it, don't relate to it, or, or don't deny it. And for those people, they're, they're less aware of how it affects their life. They're less aware of how to live positively through it or positively next to those things as well. And so that's something that I don't have to worry about. I'm very, very well aware of it. You don't have to tell me. Uh, you, nothing will be a surprise to me. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's a definite superpower of mine. I have great empathy. You know, as I said before, because I live with the things that I live with, there's nothing that I can, there's nothing that you could tell me that I would, that I would judge you about. There's nothing that you could tell me that I would think, uh, that's, you know, you can do something about that. Stop doing that or stop being that you know I, I just don't feel that and if if somebody is going through something rough or is someone been through something traumatic or something you know really difficult in their life i have great empathy for those people that's a tremendous superpower not just because i work in the therapeutic you know counseling space but also just being a human on earth empathy is a great skill it's a great muscle that needs to be built and developed and worked on it's not it's not impossible for every for anyone to have empathy, but sometimes it, it's it's one of those muscular muscular things that we have to think about and use in order to, to have it ready to be used in the future as well. And I'm very fortunate and very grateful that for my mental illnesses, I also have been given 
great empathy for other people and what they're going through as well. I know how humans work. I know how great humans can be. I know how crap humans can be because I have been both. I have been really great version of me where you know I've been really kind and really helpful and really generous and all of those things and I've been the worst version of me where I've been none of those things and where I have you know just used people and hurt people for my own gain I've been that guy and so I know the two ends of that spectrum you know the majority of people that I speak to on stage in front of it and I, and I bring this stuff up you know a lot of people know um, just they don't know the ends of the spectrum you know they just know this little bit in the middle and I'm really jealous of them you know I'd love to just have that but I can actually bring the extremes as well and I can understand how other humans can bring the extremes as well that's a massive massive superpower for me and, and another reason why those mental illnesses are a gift to me this one is big for me. When my depression is at its worst, my creativity is at its best. I wrote, I've written a couple of books, uh, one of which became a bestseller, which is called Reboot Your Thinking. It's about how I live with mental illness and addiction and, and stuff. And, you know, unsurprisingly, that's kind of what I wrote about and what resonated with people enough to, to make it a pretty good selling book. Um, the majority of that book I wrote in bed unable to get out of bed because my thinking and my depression and my mood was so disordered at the time um, that, you know, uh, my creativity came out and sort of rescued me in that way to be able to write, write what I want to write. You know, a lot of people don't get that. And a lot of people, when they're depressed and when they're down and when they're really feeling the effects of the mental illness, they don't have the creativity thing. So for me, it's a superpower. I'm really grateful for it. The downside is that I'm well. And when I'm well, and when I'm doing really well mentally, I can't create these beautiful things. I can't write well. I can't speak well. You know, it's, it's kind of a kick in the ass because I'd love it when I was feeling well to be able to do my job well too. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't often always um, pan out that way. I'm very comfortable with my mental illness. And it's not something I've always been, obviously, right? And and I, sometimes I get off stage and somebody, will, and I've just talked about, you know, my abuse or talked about my madness in some way. And people will say to me, God, you know, you make that look so easy. You're so, you're so comfortable with that. And whilst I, I agree that I'm comfortable with it, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to stand up in front of an audience and do this. It's even harder to do it on video which is going to end up on youtube and all different channels and viewed by people who i'll never have anything to do with potentially like that's that's not easy but it, every time i do it it's easier and that's really my point about going first you know taking that first step into authenticity means the next time you do it you're going to be much much more likely to be able to do it effectively and 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 well you know i'm very comfortable with who i am now because I'm not trying to be anything else. For a long time, I just tried to be well. I just tried to be normal. I tried to be like you. And it's not helpful, right? It, I, now I just try to be me, and I just try to be the best version of me. And some days I succeed, some days I do not. Sometimes in a day I succeed, sometimes in a day I do not. And with some people, I do. And with some people, I do not. But for the most part, because I'm aware of what's going on for me, I'm aware of how my brain works, I'm aware of the limitations and the, the, the upsides of that equally, then I am very, very comfortable with who I am and what I live with. And what I live with is mental illness. I know the value of connection. Now, I say often that you know, connection and addiction are on a spectrum that, that are opposite ends and they can't live together. They can't exist in the same space. If I lose connection, then I'm much more likely to become addicted. But if I have connection, then I'm much less likely to search for an addiction or to, to activate the part of my brain that, that overindulges in a healthy way in anything. It doesn't have to be just drugs and alcohol or whatever. It can be, you know, work. It can be exercise. It can be sex. It can be porn. It can be jelly beans. It could be lying. It can be obsessive thinking 
whatever it might be. But if I stay connected, I can't, I can't go down that track. You know, and sometimes connection is a difficult thing for me to chase too, because almost every day, every part of my brain just says, escape, just says, get away from everyone, be on your own. Everyone's going to let you down. Everyone's going to abuse you. Everyone's going to hurt you. And those things that play aren't real, but it's certainly very compelling and very convincing at different times in my life. So I really value the, that connection um, because, you know, that connection has also saved my life a couple of times. So I, I value human connection. I cherish it. I'll never not cherish it because it's so powerful in my life. Another thing then is, and the most important thing in so many ways, is I know the value of kindness. You know, kindness used to be something that was a given. You know, everyone just had it. And now there's been a rise in the last little while in the world of a devoid of kindness, of, of an increase in in you know concentrating on self and and our own interests and what's best for us instead of thinking about what's best for somebody else or what might be best for somebody else you know that's 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 kind of been a, di a diversion away from kindness but the truth of it is that kindness is never wasted you know it's never it's never a not a good idea <laughs> to be kind or to show kindness for someone else particularly kindness for ourselves you know, that's a big struggle for a lot of people is to be kind to yourself. And if you live with the superpowers that I live with, then you probably also know the struggle that comes with finding kindness for yourself. Even when you can start to find it for other people and be there for everyone and be the most kind person and giving person and generous person in the world, we still tend to not exercise that stuff in our own direction. And that's a bit sad. So my value, knowing the value of kindness is a great superpower for me because not only can I do things that are kind for you and think about you, but I can also spend some of that kindness on myself. So that's sort of what I think about are my gifts, you know, and how my mental illness is a gift for you. I want to give you a couple of gifts on the way out here. The first one is I think it's really important to think about this. Is when, you th when you are thinking about yourself and sometimes speaking about yourself, um, even if it's just, just to yourself in a poor way, in a negative way, it's easy to think about, you know, that I'm a piece of shit, I'm this, I'm, I'm a loser, I'm hopeless, I'm dumb, I'm fat, I'm whatever the, the record that plays in your head is. I think it's really important to, fo to remember it's not what you are, it's what you do. You know, actions will always speak louder than any words you want to you want to spout or any words that are spouted at you. It's not what you are; it's what you do, and it's what you do consistently every day. So, I'd really support you to think about that, even if it's a way to find your superpower in your flaws, in your defects. Maybe that's the first step: is to concentrate on this is what I do, this is what I show people. This is what I do for people. This is who I am for people. You know, not, not, uh, not how much money is in my bank or what car I drive. I couldn't give a shit about that stuff. I don't care what car you drive. I don't care what your job is. I don't care how much money is in your bank account. I don't care if who you're married to or even if you are. I don't care about any of those things. But what I do care about is what you do. Is, is what you do for, for me, for other people... You know, what you bring to the world is much more important than the space you take up in that world. And sometimes that's a really good gift to be able to find your gifts in the first place. And then the second gift I want to give you and want to leave with you is the little idiom, the little, the little quote that I live my life by, and it's by Carl Jung, who's my rock star kind of, kind of uh, quote giver in my life. And he said that, you know, I'm not what happened to me I'm what I choose to become. And every day I get to make that choice to be what happened to me or to be what I choose to move on and become in the future. I can be the addict. I can be the flaky junkie. I can be the mental Ill, mentally ill crackpot, fall apart dude. I can be the mental, the sexual abuse victim. I can be all of those things that sometimes the world really wants me to be, ironically, or I can be what I choose to become going forward. 
And so that's what I want to do. That's what I concentrate on being. That's what I concentrate on doing. I remember Carl Jung's quote in my head all the time. I'm not what happened to me. I'm what I, I'm what I choose to become. And you might that might help you in your own life, you know, that you think, okay, well, something happened to me as a child. Something's happening to me now, but it doesn't mean that's who I am. I get to choose every day. I get to make that choice every day as to who I'm going to become, and so do you. And I'd really encourage you to make that choice to make it of your own volition, to tell your own story, to reframe your story if you need to, away from the defects and into the superpowers because you are, you are absolutely superhuman. We all are. We, all have, we don't all know what they are. We don't all access them equally. It doesn't mean we don't. It doesn't mean they're not there, you know? And I'd really support you to find yours. And remember above all, and, and forever, this is true, and forever it will be true, that above all, kindness wins find some of that kindness today find it even you have to dig around all day for it find it make sure you spend some of that kindness on yourself but it's true in a business sense as much as a personal sense in a business sense a brand or a company you are never going to lose business by being kind you're only ever going to gain it and in a personal sense in your personal life is exactly the same you don't lose people you don't lose spirit by by investing in kindness you only ever gain it you know, it's never a wasted effort. And I'd really encourage you to have some of that effort to find some kindness today. Find it for yourself. Turn it inward and find your superpowers. I really hope you've enjoyed this today. I really hope you've got something out of it and you can see that maybe you're not full of flaws. Maybe you are full of superpowers as I am. Have a great day, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon.